Last week I did a playthrough with only Fampy and Pokemon Crystal, so I figured that this week I should do the other version exclusive and try out Teddy Ursa. This incredibly adorable bear has some decent base stats. It has 60 HP, 80 attack, and 50 in its defense, special attack, and special defense. However, its speed is its worst stat of all with only 40, so I don't think I'm going to be going first against any of the fast foes in this playthrough, and specifically later on in the game on Red's team, the Espeon, the Charizard, and the Pikachu are all going to move first. However, that's quite a ways off, and normal types are really good in Generation 2. Now, as a kid, I always thought that normal types were the worst Pokemon, like if they didn't have a cool elemental typing like grass, water, fire, ice, psychic, I was not very impressed by them. But a Pokemon like Teddy Ursa that is a mono normal type only actually has one weakness, which is the fighting type. Unfortunately in Johto, there are two major battles that feature this type prominently. That's Chuck and Bruno later on. So that isn't the reason that this type is so dominant. The reason, well, there's two reasons. Reason number one is that there are some really great normal type moves that are easy to access in Generation 2. Headbutt, Swift, and Return are all TM moves, and Teddy Ursa luckily gets access to all of them. Another advantage for its move pool in terms of moves that it just starts with is Scratch, which is basically just a better version of Tackle. It has 5 more base power and 5 more accuracy. Now the other reason that normal types are really good in these games is something that I bet some of you don't know. If you're new to my videos, I really think you won't know about this. Anyways. In Generation 2, whenever you defeat a gym leader, their badge gives moves of that type a damage boost, a 12.5% damage boost. So after Teddy Ursa defeats Whitney, all of its normal type moves will be boosted by 12.5%. We'll see this up in the top left where my moves are displaying the effective power, so this is with all the multipliers added in. Honestly, after that point, I think that this cute little bear, which I named Theodore by the way, is just going to completely steamroll the game. Aiding it in this pursuit is going to be the fact that it also learns all three of the elemental punches. So yeah, like what doesn't it have? It has great move diversity, a good typing, and for a first stage Pokemon, it has a decent attack stat. Even its growth rate doesn't hold it back because it has a medium fast growth rate. While it isn't as fast as say the medium slow growth rate or the fast growth rate, it still feels weird every time I say uh, medium fast is like slower than the medium slow growth rate. Uh, that's never gonna feel right. Anyways, I think an easy remedy for this is just to fight all the trainers in the early game. And once I arrive at the rival in Cherry Grove City, my Teddy Ursa is level six. Now you will have noticed at the beginning of the video, I replaced Totodile with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and that's because I think that Chikorita is going to give Teddy Ursa the most difficulties. After all, in Azalea Town, it will already know Razor Leaf. This is a much better move than the counterpart teams would have. They would have Ember or Water Gun. In this first trainer fight, I was actually very impressed with Teddy Ursa. It didn't even use its berry and knocks the Chikorita out with green health remaining, so... Well done, little bear. I head back to the lab, talk to the police officer, and tell him the rival's name. I almost forgot a question mark there. That would be like the ultimate sin in a Generation 2 playthrough. After freaking Elm out with the discovery of Pokemon reproduction, I head out on my journey. As I said before, I'm going to face all of the trainers on my way to Violet City. For most Pokemon, this seems to be the most reliable way to beat the game, especially if you're doing a first playthrough. Later on in the video, I'll do an optimized playthrough, and then I'll try to squeeze out as much extra time as is possible. Maybe I'll be able to skip these trainers, but since I'm not evolving in this playthrough, I don't think that that's going to be the case. Teddy Ursa is probably going to need to be around level 75 to 80 to defeat Red. Also, while I'm predicting things, I should probably make a prediction for the final time. While I was streaming this on Twitch, I predicted that my first playthrough would be somewhere around an hour and 40 minutes to an hour and 50 minutes. In the moment, I really didn't think that Teddy Ursa was going to clock in over two hours, and I estimated that its final optimized time would probably be somewhere around the 130 to 140 mark. I can't see it being faster than Pokemon like Espeon or Snorlax, and to go faster than that, it would have to be. Just before I head into Violet City, I grab the Bitterberry. It can be very useful for Karen later on in the playthrough. And after that, I luckily run into a Bellsprout. And here we actually get to see a weird quirk of Teddy Ursa's moveset. That's the fact that it learns Lick. I said while I was streaming that it didn't make much sense that this cute little bear learned that move and then everyone was just like, bears lick honey and bears lick trees. Like it makes sense. And okay, I'll, I'll give it to you. It does make sense that Teddy Ursa learns Lick. But also when I first examined the moveset, I thought that this move would be completely useless. After all, it's only 20 base power. Power. However, I can damage Bellsprout with it and then reliably catch it, which is not always the case. Sometimes I'm scared of knocking this thing out, so I just have to throw Pokeballs, and then it breaks out over and over again. But not today. Nice. 
I head into Violet City and go straight for Sprout Tower. In all of my playthroughs, I play by certain rules, which are only my starter in battle, no items in battle except for held items, no glitches, exploits, or RNG manipulation, and I'm not allowed to use evasion boosting moves before level 100. There are some finer details of these rules, which you can see in the description if you're really curious, but one unstated rule is the fact that I always do Sprout Tower. This is technically an optional area. You might also notice that the clock isn't always running at a consistent speed in the top left, and that's because we're stretching out and compressing the footage when we edit the videos. Anyways, coming back to my original point, on 4 times game speed, it is just way too hard to navigate places like Mount Silver when you can't see where you're going. Plus, I really think that in Generation 2, the darkness that they make you navigate in caves is the worst kind of the first three generations. Like, in Generation 1, you can kind of see where you're going and in generation 3 you can piece together where you're going because there's a little circle around your character but in generation 2 like everything is just black except items in your character it is so hard to move around and figure out where to go so i defeat the sage at the top of the tower and earn myself the flash hm after that i use an escape rope and i head straight for the gym after all i have enough pp to knock out the mandatory trainers here Defeating Birdkeeper Rod gives Teddy Ursa just enough experience to level up to level 13, so now I am ready for Faulkner and I'm over a damage rounding threshold, which is really convenient. Let's do this. Now in Generation 2, the AI typically picks moves based on how much damage the moves do, so in this case the Pidgey is only going to use Tackle, which means it really can't do anything to Teddy Ursa and I finish it off over two turns. Next is Pidgeotto, I go for Scratch, it does less than half, Pidgeotto selects Gust, after all it has the same type of attack bonus so it's going to do the most damage, and then I reroll Scratch, and this time I actually get a better damage range so I knocked his ace out in two hits. That was a really easy first gym leader. And there are actually two prizes from receiving his badge. Number one, my attack stat, which is already great, gets a 12.5% boost. You can see that denoted by the little badge icon in the bottom left. And I also get the TM for Mud Slap, which I teach to Teddy Ursa right away. After all, it's really useful in Union Cave to defeat the two hikers that are there. One of them is like kind of optional. He's a spinner and it's really hard to get by him. As you can see in this footage, I tried my best to use the bag trick to stop his sprite from spinning, but making the sharp turn is just a little bit too hard for me and he catches me. Luckily I have mud slap and it's up to the task, so I defeat him with ease. Throughout the rest of the cave I defeat all of the optional trainers, yes, even this guy with his slowpoke. After defeating him I head down to the basement floor, and here I can pick up TM39 which is swift. Obviously this move has base 60 power and it never misses, so it is going to be an amazing upgrade for Scratch. I kept Leer on my moveset just in case I need to lower, say, the Scyther's defense to be able to knock it out fast enough, but I'm hoping that isn't the case. Either way, Swift has enough PP, and that's really all I'm giving up by unlearning Scratch. Outside the cave, there is a uh, Hiker Anthony. Now, we have to talk about him. He is so bad in some of these runs, like, the Geodude isn't going to be an issue today because I'm not weak to rock moves, but the following Machop knows low kick, and in this generation it doesn't deal weight based damage, so it's just base 50 power with a chance to flinch. I go for swift against it, and it almost KOs, Machop strikes back with low kick, and Teddy Ursa hangs on at red health. Okay, so that fight was very close. I finish off the rocket plotline next, it's really easy for Teddy Ursa, like this thing is just a complete beast with Swift. After that I head into the gym, I fight all the trainers here, and this has been the case up until this point in the game. I think the only trainer that I skipped was the guy in Union Cave who has an Onyx. I really didn't want to waste my time mud slapping that thing down, like it probably would have taken three or four hits. Onyx has incredible defense and basically nothing else. It is completely a terrible Pokemon. So now with all the Onyx insults out of my system, let's take on Bugsy. He leads with Metapod. I was hoping that Swift would get the one hit, but it doesn't. At least the Cocoon only uses Harden. Up next is Kakuna, and I actually one-shot this thing, which takes Teddy Ursa up to level 20, so I'm over a damage rounding threshold for the Scyther. Now, check this out. Scyther goes for Fury Cutter, which does only 7 hit points of damage to Teddy Ursa, even with a critical hit. And then, my Swift does more than half. So yeah, there's no way that I lose here. I knock Scyther out on the next turn and I've earned myself the second badge. Now something interesting about Teddy Ursa's moveset is the fact that it can actually learn Fury Cutter. I'm not really sure why this cute bear can learn a bug move. Also, normally this move is great against Whitney, but today I have access to Rollout and that is going to be the far superior option. However, before that I have to defeat the rival outside of Azalea Town and he can be a serious problem sometimes. 
First up is Ghastly. I go for Mud Slap. It doesn't quite knock it out. Ghastly uses Spite, lowering Mud Slap's PP. But today that isn't an issue, like it was when I used Snorlax. Because if I run out of Mud Slap, I'll just use Lick instead. I finish the Ghastly off on the next turn. Zubat comes in. I go for Swift. It gets the one hit. And now all that's left is his Ace, Bayleaf. I go for Swift. It does more than half. Bayleaf uses Razor Leaf and misses. So, another easy fight for Teddy Ursa. This thing, oh my gosh, it's tearing through the game with its tiny cute claws. Look at it, it's covering its mouth. It's like, oh, did I just do that? Yeah, you did. This thing is a complete beast. You might be wondering if I'm going to do an Ursa Ring playthrough, and yes, I am. I'm going to do it versus Dawn Fan later on in the year, and I am really excited for that match. I think it's going to be very fun. After all, like I mentioned at the start, these are version exclusives. In Pokemon Gold, you can get Fampy and Dawn Fan, and in Pokemon Silver, you can get Teddy Ursa and Ursa Ring. Now, as if things weren't already going well, in the forest, I can pick up the TM for Headbutt. I teach this immediately to Teddy Ursa. At this point in the game, after the second Gym Leader, moves that lower the opponent's stats are basically dead weight, so I get rid of Leer. In Goldenrod Town, I do all my errands, like grab an Abra, pick up Kenya. These will be useful HM users later on in the playthrough. I know this is a solo Teddy Ursa run, but I do allow myself to use any field move to speed up the playthrough. After all, every Pokemon that I do these runs with has access to HM users that they can use to speed up their time in this way. Now, while I was clearing out the Goldenrod Underground, I had the chance to learn Faint Attack. This move, I always forget, and all of you mention it to me in the comments, so thank you so much, by the way. It bypasses accuracy checks. That's the part about it that I always forget. I just don't use it, and I've been hit by, like, smoke screen, and everyone's like, please, just use Faint Attack. Okay, so I'm going to teach it to Teddy Ursa in the place of Lick, just in case I need it. I grab the coin case, give Teddy Ursa a nice haircut so that it loves me more. After all, Return is going to be the go-to move eventually. And then I head north, finishing off a lot of the trainers as I go. I also go slightly out of my way to pick up the TM for Rollout. I don't really want to use this move, but if I have to, I will. Next, I speak with Floria. She runs away from me, and then I head into National Park, because in here there's the TM for Dig, and I really want to grab this before I head to Whitney. That's because I can use Abra to teleport myself back to Goldenrod City, so that I don't waste the walking time backtracking from this like weird, obscure location. In Whitney's Gym, I defeat more trainers, and after I defeat the last one, Teddy Ursa is level 26, so let's see how I do against the normal type gym leader. First is Clefairy. I go for Headbutt, and it gets the one hit. All right, so that's good. Tank comes in next. I go for Headbutt. It does just under half. The cow starts to roll, but it does very little damage and then just misses on the next turn. It does get a bit annoying here because it starts using Milk Drink, trying to mess me up. And because it's outspeeding, I can't cause flinches with Headbutt. However, eventually it's going to either run out of Milk Drink PP or it's going to try to attack. Finally, it uses Rollout, and I knock it out. So that was an easy third badge. And with it, Teddy Ursa gets a boost to both its speed stat and all normal type moves. So Headbutt has an effective power of 118 now. It's not particularly useful against the Pseudo Wudo. Things actually got a little bit scary here because as I'm damaging it with Mud Slap, it connected with two flails, taking Teddy Ursa momentarily down to orange health. But luckily this wild Pokemon's not very good, so I finish it off. And now it is time for the Ecritique City portion of the game. If you've watched some of my old or crystal playthroughs, you'll know that at this point in the game, I usually go and pick up Hidden Power. But starting in 2023, I have banned using Hidden Power in first attempt playthroughs. This is just because the move was getting really boring and like, it was basically either Hidden Power Ground or Hidden Power Ice was just really good. But in this case with Teddy Ursa, I don't actually know if Hidden Power is ever going to be useful. After all, this cute little bear has an ice move in the form of Ice Punch which I forgot to buy at the department store, by the way. Like, ah, so frustrating. Anyways, it also has a ground move in the form of Dig and Mud Slap and Earthquake. Yes, Teddy Ursa has all of the ground type TMs. And no, Gligar does not get any of them. Ah, so frustrating. Anyways, I think I can beat the rival in Burn Tower right away because I don't really need a moveset upgrade for him. First is Haunter. Obviously, Faint Attack is the best move here. Unfortunately, it did move first, so I had a curse put on me. Now, the thing about this move in Generation 2 is that it doesn't deal damage if you knock the opponent's Pokemon out. I was really hoping that Mud Slap would one-shot the Magnemite, but it doesn't, so I take some curse damage. At least Sonic Boom misses. 
Now in the moment I was thinking that I should teach Dig for this fight, but that really only works if you move first against the Haunter. After all, it'd still take curse damage when I was underground. I make it to the Bayleaf, use Headbutt, it does more than half, it tries to use Poison Powder, misses, and then I knock it out. So it looks like the uh, rival's theme today is he's just going to miss all of his final moves against Teddy Ursa. Because Mudslap is just really not going to be enough against Morty, and I would rather hit him with physical moves, especially considering my attack stat has a boost and my special attack doesn't, and it's lower anyways, I teach Dig in the place of Mud Slap now. I head out onto Route 38 and finish off some of the trainers here. I really like to clear them out as soon as possible. Also, doing all of this first before fighting Morty is really great because then I can get the Mint Berry so that I can avoid Hypnosis on the Gengar. It has 64 speed so my Teddy Ursa is not going to move first and I need Counterplay to Hypnosis. After that's done I teleport back to Ecritique City and then I head south because here on Sundays there is Sunny who gives you the Magnet. So this boosts the power of electric type moves. And on my way south, I might as well backtrack all the way to Goldenrod City so that I can pick up the punches. It might seem like this is going to waste a lot of time, but it really isn't because I can just use Abra to teleport back to Ecritique City after I pick up the TMs. So now, let's take on Morty. First up is Ghastly, and this thing's really annoying if you don't move first, but luckily Teddy Ursa is fast enough and dig one-shots, so no curse from it. Now the Haunter that follows can also put a curse on you, but I am so lucky that I have one more speed than it. So thank you Whitney's badge, I really needed that. Next is Gengar, obviously it outspeeds, but it just goes for mean look, so that's pretty good. Teddy Ursa hits Dig and it does a lot, but the Gengar survives on red health. Next turn it uses Hypnosis, connects, putting me to sleep, but my mint berry wakes Teddy Ursa up and I knock out Morty's ace with faint attack. All that remains is Haunter. This one is a higher level, so it has more speed, but that doesn't really matter because the only damage dealing move that it has is Nightshade and Teddy Ursa is a normal type, so yeah, that's a free knockout. And with that, I've earned myself the fourth badge. Now there's so much stuff that I have to do next, a lot of errands in Olivine City, and then I have to take care of all the trainers in the lighthouse. But after all of this, I'm going to have to go up against Chuck. He's the fighting type gym leader in Johto, and so this should be Teddy Ursa's greatest challenge yet. One thing working in my favor is the fact that Chuck only has two Pokemon, so I'm not going to have to sustain for a particularly long amount of time. Also, Dynamic Punch is known for missing, so I might be able to get an easy victory just because of luck. However, that's not the only difficulty in Chuck's gym, because just inside the door, there are these two trainers, and when you step in their line of sight, they both battle you one after another. In my playthroughs, I always save here because I call these two the tag team trainers and I just do not want to have to reset against them. After all, the first guy starts with a Hitmonlee, and this thing is definitely a powerful fighting type. In this case, it outspeeds Teddy Ursa, goes for jump kick, and does so much damage. But I hang on with orange health, strike back with headbutt, and that does enough to knock it out. Okay, that was really tense. However, now Teddy Ursa is pretty bruised for the following fight against Hitmonchan. Now, it's not particularly good before the physical special split in Generation 4. Also, it's not very fast. Teddy Ursa moves first with Headbutt, but it doesn't do enough to get the knockout. And then Hitmonchan strikes back with Fire Punch. This is a great way to display Hitmonchan's very poor special attack. And after that, I take it out on the next turn. Okay, so that could have been a reset. The Hitmonchan, after all, can use Ice Punch and freeze you in that battle. But luckily for me, I'm able to head back to the Pokemon Center and heal up. With those two trainers out of the way, I still have to face Nob in the gym. He has a Machop and a Machoke. I don't think he's going to be that scary today, so let's see how this goes. I use Headbutt on the Machop, get a lucky critical hit, knocking it out in one hit. Alright, that's good. Next is Machoke. I go for Headbutt, it takes it to red health, and causes a flinch, so that's all I needed. With him out of the way, it's now time to face Chuck. He leads with Primeape. Its only fighting type move is Karate Chop, which has a high critical hit ratio, so I'm really hoping it doesn't use that. Okay, so far so good, it goes for Leer on the first turn. I use Headbutt, and it doesn't get the knockout, like, that's so unfortunate. And then Primeape uses Karate Chop. Alright, so, uh, Leer was really bad. Yeah, really bad, because Primeape also gets a critical hit, knocking Teddy Ursa out in a single turn. Alright, so that is my first reset of the playthrough. I guess it makes sense that it was at Chuck. Alright, let's see if I can roll better damage in the next fight. Once again, Primeape uses Leer on the first turn, lowering Teddy Ursa's defense. I go for Headbutt. It does roll better damage, 
but doesn't get the knockout. However, instead of following Lear with Karate Chop, this time Primeape goes for Fury Swipes and this move is really bad. It has low accuracy, so it just misses. And with that, I move on to his ace, Polyrath. Now, I probably should have been holding the Magnet here to boost Thunder Punch's damage. I go for it, but it doesn't even do half. I'm pretty sure the Headbutt would do more damage, so I'll use that on the next turn if I get there, because Polyrath uses Dynamic Punch. However, in this case, it misses. I guess that's sort of to be expected. I go for Headbutt on the next turn, get a critical hit, and Polyrath goes down. Alright, so I think in my optimized playthrough, I will have to go into this fight at a slightly higher level, just so that I get the guaranteed one hit against the Primeape. That will definitely make things much more consistent. Now with Fly, I head back to the first root of the game and pick up the Pink Bow, which is going to be incredible for Teddy Ursa, another boost to normal type moves. After that I do a bunch more errands, I pick up the Nugget and Rare Candy south of Goldenrod City, then I defeat these three cool trainers and earn myself the Soft Sand. This could be useful with Earthquake later on. After that I head to Violet City, picking up the Rare Candy here, and with that out of the way, it is finally time to head over to the Lake of Rage. I want to make a quick note here, which is that in Mount Mortar, you actually don't have to use Flash. If you played Gold and Silver as a kid, you would have remembered this place being very dark. I think overall this is a really nice change in Crystal version. It allows you to get to Mahogany Town a little bit more easily when you don't have Surf. Outside of the cave, I want to skip this trainer, so I head down into the grass. And I do have a Super Repel active right now, but I still run into a Pokemon and uh, yeah, it turns out it's Entei. So I might as well try and catch it. After all, that would be pretty cool if I caught one of the legendary dogs, but unfortunately it breaks out of my great ball and flees right away. I head north of the lake just so I can grab the rare candy. I accidentally picked up hidden power here, but no, I won't be using it in this playthrough. After that, I fly back to the lake and fight the Gyarados. It's very easy to knock out because I have Thunder Punch. I really thought I was going to get the one hit. I don't. I cause paralysis and then I knock it out on the next turn. By the way, you do have to either defeat it or catch it. You can't just run away from this one. After that, I chat with Lance. He spirals off into the sky. And then Lance's uh, Dragonite beats up this guy. A lot of you commented mentioning that it's in fact a Dragonite, but like that sprite really looks like Charizard. I do not believe for a moment that it is a Dragonite in this game. I know in the remakes it is definitely a Dragonite. Anyways, let's proceed. I've added a little feature to my overlay here because there's a protein that you can pick up, so I thought it would be nice to show the number of vitamins that my Pokemon can take when I'm at this location. In most Johto playthroughs, I won't have used any vitamins at this point, so normally these numbers are going to be pretty high. Alright, so we have the power of video editing on our side, so let's not waste any more time in this boring section of the game. Let's head directly to the next major battle, which is Price. Headbutt's a great way for just raw damage. Thunder Punch is also an option. I used it against Seal because it is super effective and has slightly higher effective power. I know that my special attack stat is much lower though, and unfortunately in this case, I think that that's the reason I didn't get the one hit. Seal strikes back with Icy Wind, lowering my speed, and I finish it on the next turn. Okay, time for the Dugong. I go for Thunder Punch again. After all, I don't think that Headbutt's gonna one hit this thing, and I'm not gonna flinch because I'm moving second, so Thunder Punch could cause paralysis, which would be nice. It does half, Dugong strikes back with Aurora Beam, lowering my attack stat, and then I knock it out on the next turn with a lucky critical hit. I think I would have got it anyways. Okay, now it's time for Price's Ace, Piloswine. Of course, Thunder Punch won't do anything to it because it's a ground type. Dig doesn't make any sense because it's a two turn move, so headbutt it is. Also, I'm really lucky here that even with the speed drop, I'm still faster than the Piloswine, so I move first, use headbutt, and get a critical hit knocking out in one turn. Alright, so that's it, Price is no more. Now of course Jasmine is up next, and here I want to talk about a piece of feedback that so many of you have given me in the comments. And that piece of feedback is, why don't you use Fire Punch against her? Most times I try to use a ground type move against the Magnemites, after all it is four times effective, and then with them out of the way I usually use Ice Punch on the Steelix. I think here I was getting caught in a little bit of a trap, which is the fact that Ice is super effective against ground Pokemon and the Steelix has low special defense. I do of course know that Steel resists Ice, but I was just like, a special move that is neutrally effective, I might as well use that. Plus it has the chance to freeze, which adds a bit of consistency, and Ice Punch is very useful throughout all of the mid game, as well as against Claire who's coming up next. However, while Fire Punch is much less useful overall in the playthrough, like yeah, it is useful against Koga, like the Fortress especially, but it's not really that useful anywhere else. Still, it does do two times damage to the Steelix, and I think just for that reason alone, I really need to consider this move more, so thank you so much for your comments. To make sure that Fire Punch is doing as much damage as possible, I backtrack to Azalea Town and pick up the Charcoal. With that, I'm going to get a 10% boost to this Fire Move's power, so let's take on Jasmine.
So first up are two Magnemites, and of course Dig is the right choice here. It's just going to do way more than Fire Punch. While I'm defeating both of them, I just want to mention the fact that I replaced Headbutt for Fire Punch, and that's because the normal type move is basically useless in this fight, and I'm going to get Return right after this in the department store, so I was going to delete Headbutt anyways. Okay, so the Magnemites are out of the way, now let's face Steelix. I go for Fire Punch, and it does so much, taking the Iron Snake down to red health. It strikes back with an Iron Tail, which does about a third. Luckily, it doesn't compromise my nice defense. Jasmine uses a Hyper Potion Healing Steelix, but that means I get two Fire Punches in a row, and with that, she's defeated. Okay, so Fire Punch was really good. Next, I fly to Goldenrod City and teach Teddy Ursa a return in the place of Fire Punch. And this normal type move is like probably the best move in all of Generation 2. Like yes, Curse is really good, and there are a couple great move combos like Sleep Talk and Rest, as well as Roll Out and Defense Curl. However, I do think that Return is better than all of these moves, and that's just because there is a badge type boost from Whitney's badge, there is an attack boost from Faulkner's badge. Then there is the pink bow, which I am going to equip now. And after all of that, Teddy Ursa also gets stabbed. So for the rest of the playthrough, I think that this is pretty much going to be the go-to move, unless the move I'm using does four times damage to the opposing Pokemon. So now let's jump to the important battle in the rocket plot line. There are essentially two of them. I think the first one against this rocket executive who has five coughing and one wheezing is probably the hardest battle. Luckily for Teddy Ursa today, I have Dig. So I can one-shot all of the Pokemon, that means they don't have a chance to use Smokescreen or to use Self-Destruct. The second major battle is against the rival in the underground, and yes, I actually think that the rival who has a team of diverse Pokemon is worse than the Rocket Executive with only the coughing line. In all of my experience with this game, the only reason this rival is really a challenge is if you don't have a ground-type move to deal with the Magnemite, because then your solo Pokemon can get paralyzed, which impacts its results throughout the rest of the fight. Of course, today I have Dig, so I take an easy victory here. With the rival out of the way and all the rockets in the basement, I head back into the department store. This is where I really like to buy vitamins. After all, I've saved up a lot of money and items that I can sell at this point in the playthrough. I decide to buy two protein because I picked one up in the rocket hideout, which I didn't use yet, and I don't want to max out my attack stat right now because there is one more protein and ice path that I would really like to use. After that, I pick up five calcium. After all, these boost both your special attack and special defense in this game. Yes, the two special stats have a unified stat experience bucket. Because I still have enough money to buy one more vitamin, I pick up a Carbos after all, just outspeeding one more Pokemon later on in the game might be nice. With that out of the way, I head into Ice Path, and here I have to put my shame on display for everyone. If you've watched my streams, you've probably seen me take the most inefficient route possible to pick up Waterfall. So uh, Pontus Fernstrom tweeted at me and said, uh, Hey Scott, I noticed that you've taken a weird, to me at least, path to Waterfall in Johto. I do it like this. And yes, this route is much better, so I'll be using it from now on. Thank you so much for helping me out. Later in the cave, I pick up the Nevermelt Ice, and then I teach Teddy Ursa Ice Punch in the place of Thunder Punch. Now, I'm ready to take on Claire. So in this case, I uh, had a sad realization, which is Return is going to do more damage to the Dragonairs, even when Ice Punch is super effective and when I'm holding the Nevermelt Ice. That's because the Dragonairs have slightly more special defense than they have physical defense, and my attack stat is about 30% higher than my special attack stat. Either way here, I went for Ice Punch and it still gets the job done, so this is not a hard fight. I make it to the Kingdra, I go for Return, it survives on red health, lowers my accuracy with Smokescreen, Claire uses a Hyper Potion, but my next two returns hit, and so that's it. I've earned myself the 8th badge. Now after answering a bunch of questions in the Dragon's Den, I did forget to pick up the Dratini, so I do have to backtrack and pick that up later, wasting a little bit of time. This is always why I do optimized playthroughs. It is so hard to play perfectly in your first attempt. After grabbing the rare candies, I head into Victory Road, and here I pick up the TM for Earthquake. I teach it immediately in the place of Dig, and with that, I'm ready to face the rival. Now this fight is going to be really easy for Teddy Ursa, so I want to talk about something else that I've been doing in this playthrough. Just after I defeated Morty, I had started to realize that Teddy Ursa is like, not having any issues at all. Defeating Chuck with only one reset further proved this to me, and because of that I started cutting all of the optional trainers out of this route. Because of that, Teddy Ursa is arriving at the League at only level 51. And at this point, I was very convinced that it was going to be absolutely fine, because normal types are fantastic. So, let's see how the Elite Four goes.
Will's up first, he leads with Zatu. I go for return. Oh, so his bird outspeeds Teddy Ursa, hits Psychic, doing more than half. And then luckily my return gets the one hit. Unfortunately, Jinx is next, and it immediately puts Teddy Ursa to sleep. Okay, so the fact that I was level 51 meant that I didn't outspeed the Zatu, and now I have two less speed than the Jinx. This is really unfortunate. As a result, Teddy Ursa goes down, and that is my second reset. So when I was playing this challenge, I wasn't looking at my speed stats, so I just attempted again, and uh, yeah, once again, the Jinx finishes me off. Okay, so I'm gonna try a third time here because I was not checking my speed stat. I was just assuming Teddy Ursa is really slow. Wheels Pokemon are probably very fast, so there's no way that I could outspeed them. But like, if I leveled up like three times, I would outspeed pretty much everything except the final Zatu, and this fight would be much easier. However, in the third fight, the Jinx just chooses Double Slap and Return knocks it out in a single hit. After that, Executor isn't much of a threat. It sets up Leech Seed and then I knock it out. The following Slowbro really just likes to set up and like, he doesn't heal it ever, so yeah. I make it to the final Zatu. It goes for Psychic. Teddy Ursa survives on red health, and then I knock it out with one more return. All right, so we've made it to Koga. It did require some luck, and I really should have planned for that will fight much better. However, I don't expect Koga to be much of an issue. He normally isn't. Unfortunately, though, it takes me four turns to knock the Fortress out, and it actually gets a critical hit, taking Teddy Ursa to just over half health before I finally take it down. Next is Muck, and of course, Earthquake polishes this thing off easily. It does take two hits, but it only sets up acid armor, so I took no damage. However, then Crobat comes out, and it's way faster than Teddy Ursa. It sets up double team right away. I miss my Ice Punch, and then I miss the next one as well. That gives Crobat time to take me down to red health, and uh, yeah, that means Teddy Ursa's lost again. So as I attempt Koga again, here's the thing I want to mention. Things got a lot harder as soon as the league started, and that's before we get to Bruno. So potentially this is the first major obstacle for Teddy Ursa. Luckily in my second attempt against Koga, the Crobat doesn't get nearly as annoying and I finish it off. Okay, so now we have to take on Bruno. Against the Hitmontop, I go for Earthquake because this thing loves to use Dig. It takes it out over two turns. In this case, I think I probably should have gone for Return on the first turn and then used Earthquake on the second turn. Either way, I knock his lead out without taking any damage. Against Hitmonlee, I really should have used Return because it survives Earthquake, kind of surprisingly actually because it has low defense, and then it strikes back with High Jump Kick, which does so much. However, Teddy Ursa hangs on with Orange Health, and I finish it off on the next turn. However, that's not great though because the Hitmonchan has Mock Punch, which is a priority move. It hits me first, and Teddy Ursa survives with three hit points. Return hits, and it finishes the Hitmonchan off. However, Machamp has both a higher level and a higher defense stat than the Hitmonchan, so it's probably gonna survive return. But Teddy Ursa gets the most critical of critical hits and finishes it off in a single turn. All that's left is Onyx, and despite this snake having a decent speed stat, Teddy Ursa is still faster, hits Ice Punch, and defeats Bruno on its first attempt. Although I do think that the lucky critical hit was required against the Machamp. Still, we are not in the clear yet though, because Karen's next and she is known for giving Pokemon resets. Before the fight, I had to decide what the right item was. In this case, it's really a toss up between the Pink Bow, the Bitterberry, and the Paralyzed Cureberry. The Bitterberry helps against Confusion on the Umbreon, and the Paralyzed Cureberry helps if you can't one hit the Vile Plume. In this case, I just wanted to see what damage ranges were like with the Pink Bow and hope that I can one hit the Vile Plume. Luckily for me, I am doing more than half to the Umbreon, but unlucky for me, it uses Sand Attack, I miss Return, and then it confuses me with Confuse Ray. Teddy Ursa hits itself and gets hit by Faint Attack, and then finally finishes her first Pokemon off. Okay, so it's time for the Vile Plume. Now, even though Ice Punch is super effective, Return has a higher effective power, so I think that this is the right choice. Unfortunately, Confusion causes Teddy Ursa to hit itself, and Vileplume lands the Paralysis. Next, Vileplume starts using Petal Dance, and yeah, this fight is gonna be a loss. I go for Return, and even with the Pink Bow, it does not get the one hit. Alright, so the Paralyzed Curaberry is definitely the right choice here. In the next fight, I make it past the Umbreon, only sustaining one Sand Attack. Against the Vileplume, I obviously don't get the one hit, but the Paralyzed Curaberry heals me, so I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, time for the Gengar. Now, it moves first using Curse, but then I can finish it off with Earthquake, so I take no Curse damage before the Murkrow comes out. Against the bird, I'm actually speed tied. I luck out, move first, hit return, and knock it out. So that's one more turn with no Curse damage. Now, Houndoom is gonna move first. It hits Flamethrower doing almost half, and now I really need to hope that Sand Attack doesn't mess up my return. It doesn't, I hit, cross my fingers, and I do enough damage. Okay, so Teddy Ursa has made it to Lance.
Now at this point in the run I had to make a choice. I could reteach Thunder Punch to one-shot the Gyarados in the place of, say, Earthquake. After all, it is completely useless against Lance's team. However, holding onto Earthquake for later in the game I think just makes more sense. After all, it makes Surge, Brock, Blaine, and Janine very easy. Alternatively, I could have replaced Return, but I think that I would rather have that for the Charizard later on in the fight. Plus, the Gyarados really just likes to set up Rain Dance, which is what happens here, so I finish it off in two turns and take no damage. Next is Dragonite. Obviously, a Never Melt Ice boosted Ice Punch takes it out in one hit, and that means that Lance's second Dragonite is also going to be a one hit. Time for the Aerodactyl. Obviously, it outspeeds, hits a Hyper Beam, doing about a third, and then I take it out with two Ice Punches. Okay, Charizard time. It moves first, hitting Flamethrower, taking Teddy Ursa down to orange health, and then I hit Return, which gets the one hit. So Lance only has one more Pokemon left, and at this point in the playthrough, I looked down at it, and the Dragonite has 98 speed, but Teddy Ursa has 97 speed. <laughs> oh, I can't believe that. As a result, Dragonite moves first, hits Outrage, gets a critical hit, and finishes me off. So I tried the fight again, and I made it back to the Aerodactyl without taking any damage. It looks like that's going to happen very consistently. However, it also looks like the Aerodactyl wants to use Hyper Beam against Teddy Ursa, and then the Charizard is going to get a Flamethrower in, which leaves me on orange health for the final Dragonite, and yeah, if it outspeeds, it's going to take me out. I think even if it gets the unfavorable roll, that's going to happen. So one potential solution here is using a single rare candy to level me up once, then hopefully the experience from the first five Pokemon on Lance's team will level Teddy Ursa up again so that it can outspeed the Dragonite. However, in this case, the Aerodactyl goes for Ancient Power and then Hyper Beam, which means it does more damage to me and Charizard polishes me off with Flamethrower. In the next fight, I will admit I just forgot to use the rare candy. In situations like this, especially in first playthroughs, I'm just going to attempt and see if I can get some kind of crazy luck throughout the fight. And in this case, I do, because I freeze the Aerodactyl, which means I can use Rest to heal and hopefully move on to the Charizard with full health. What I'm hoping for is that then I will be able to survive the Dragonite's Outrage and finish it off with a single Ice Punch. Of course in Generation 2 the Aerodactyl can defrost, but in this case it doesn't. I wake up, finish it off, and move on to the Charizard. Okay, just please don't critical hit me. It doesn't, and with that Teddy Ursa is moving on to the Dragonite with green health. I'm really confident that this is going to work. I get hit by Outrage, survive, connect with Ice Punch, and the Dragonite goes down. As is to be expected, Kanto is very easy for Teddy Ursa, like I even go into the Janine fight without healing, why would I? She's terrible. I sweep through her team, and with that I've made it to the second hardest trainer in the game, it's time to face Blue. His team's type diversity really is what makes him so challenging to get through. I was hoping that against the Pidgeot I would be able to knock it out with Ice Punch, but in this case I just get a lucky freeze, so yeah, I basically finished it off in one turn. You'll notice here that I'm using the leftovers. This means every turn in battle I'm going to gain back some of my health, which is a great way to give your solo Pokemon a little bit more sustain. After all, one Pokemon against six is very challenging and the leftovers helps balance this out. Against the Alakazam, I take a lot of damage from Psychic, but my return finishes it off in one hit. Rhydon comes out, I heal a little bit of health with the leftovers, and then I use Ice Punch, which I was hoping was going to get the job done, but it doesn't, so the Rhinoceros sets up Sandstorm. In Generation 2, this does 1 8th damage per turn, which is a lot, so at this point I was like, well, maybe I should use Rest to heal up and then move on with more health. But in this case, the Rhydon is doing way too much damage with Earthquake, so Teddy Ursa goes down as a result of my misplay. Alright, so are you ready to channel all of our Generation 2? Well, let's do it, because I can set up Curse against the Pidgeot. The strategy here is obvious, as I increase my defense stat, its wing attacks are going to do less and less damage, and then the leftovers will hopefully heal me fully by the time I'm ready to knock it out. Unfortunately, I don't get the healing that I wanted, but I still am able to knock the Pidgeot out and move on to the Alakazam with nearly full health. Of course it's going to outspeed, so it moves first, hits me, and then I finish it off with Return, but now I can use Earthquake against the Rhydon. It just goes for Fury Attack, which is a terrible choice, and then I finish it off in one hit. Gyarados sets up Rain dance, I one hit with return, Executor tries Leech Seed, and I one hit with return, and then Arcanine comes out, it gets a flamethrower in, doesn't do enough damage, and even though it burns Teddy Ursa, my Earthquake still gets the one hit. Now I'm going to use this next little bit of downtime to figure out what moveset I should go into the final battle with. Obviously Return and Curse make sense to have. 
I can reteach Teddy Ursa Rest with the TM so that I have some sustain, but then I have some play with my last move. I could bring in Protect to negate Charm on the first turn, or I could use a move like Sleep Talk so that I can attack after I heal up. Potentially Rollout could be good, but I don't really want to use this move if I don't have to. After all, once you start moving it, you can't stop. There is also potential to bring Ice Punch into the fight because it could cause some freezes which would be lucky along the way. After using all 10 of my rare candies, taking Teddy Ursa to level 75, I'm ready to try Red for the first time. Okay, so the Pikachu is much faster than Teddy Ursa, so I have no chance of going first. I think my best bet here is to just go for return and hope that I get the one hit right away. However, Pikachu uses Thunder, does almost half, and also causes Paralysis. Luckily, my return does hit, and it takes Red's lead out in one hit. However, this fight is just not going to work, because Espeon comes out next, it sets up Reflect, and then Return doesn't even do half to it. It strikes back with Psychic after that, taking Teddy Ursa down to red health, and because I don't finish it off on the next turn, that's my first reset here against red. Alright, so let's try this fight again, but bring Sleep Talk into the fight, and maybe I can set up Curse against the Pikachu. The combined healing of Leftovers, as well as Rest, and then the ability to use Sleep Talk should let me increase my attack stat by at least one stage before I move on to the Espeon, and then even with Reflect, I will be able to two-shot it. If I can do that, then I can get to the Snorlax, where setting up my defense will be very valuable. I'll survive long enough, be able to rest up, and then hopefully get through the rest of his team. However, in this case, because the Pikachu is doing so much damage to me, and because I'm slower than it, especially after I use Curse, it just knocks me out before I heal. I tried again, figuring that I could time rest a little bit better, but once again, it paralyzes me with thunder, and then I can't move, and as a result, Teddy Ursa goes down. Okay, so here's a fact about Sunny Day, which I can teach to Teddy Ursa, by the way, so I put it in the place of Sleep Talk. This lowers Thunder's accuracy from 70% to 50%. And it seems that the AI knows about this, because as soon as I set up Sunny Day, Pikachu just starts using Quick Attack. However, that doesn't seem to be consistently what Pikachu is going to do, because eventually it uses Charm, lowering my attack, which is really annoying when I'm trying to set up for the Espeon. And then when the sunlight fades, Pikachu moves first before I set up Sunny Day again, and as a result, Thunder hits doing almost half to Teddy Ursa. And then for some reason, even though the sun is out, Pikachu is just like, no, I'm going to keep using Thunder. It does, and as a result, I go down once again. This strategy has another flaw to it, because the Pikachu also knows Thunderbolt, which is 100% accurate even when the sun is out, so it can do massive damage to me even in this case. Once again, eventually Teddy Ursa gets paralyzed, I can't move, and Pikachu finishes me off again. So things were not going well with the Sunny Day strategy, so I decided to switch back into the Sleep Talk strategy. However, there's still another problem, which is the fact that if I'm setting up on the Pikachu, it is going to roll Thunder more times, and that gives it more of a chance to paralyze me. Once I'm paralyzed, my consistency is cut, and as a result, the Pikachu either forces me to heal, or it finishes me off with good luck. Alright, so it's time to backtrack into Kanto and pick up an item that I forgot. This is the TM for Protect. This way, on the first turn of the battle, I can prevent Pikachu from using Charm. And also, I think that I can stall the Pikachu out so that it can't use Thunder anymore. By doing this, which uh, takes a long time, by the way, we are over two hours now. So Teddy Ursa is definitely running into a lot more problems against Red than I expected. As a result, I am over my original predictions time for the first playthrough. However, with this new strategy, I do manage to take the Pikachu out and move on to the Espeon, but like, it happened at the worst possible time because Pikachu got a Thunder in and yeah, I'm at low health now. I was hoping that if I used Protect, maybe the Espeon wouldn't KO me, but like, no, it's doing way too much damage, so. Oh, also a critical hit, just great. However, in the next fight, I am able to successfully stall the Pikachu out, heal up, and now that I'm set up, I have plus three attack, and the Pikachu can't use Thunder anymore, I go for the KO, and I knock it out, so I make it to the Espeon with full health. Because Pikachu used a last minute charm, I'm probably not gonna one hit the Espeon, but I am gonna get a two hit. However, Espeon crushes all of my hopes, because Psychic does more than half. However, then with plus one, I actually knock it out in one hit. Okay, so that's perfect because now I've made it to the Snorlax. This thing's only physical move is Body Slam, and that means that I'm going to be able to set up more curses to max out my attack stat. Once this is done, I heal up, and then I strike back with Return, knocking the Snorlax out in one hit. Time for the Venusaur. This thing is going to be easy to take out because it tries to set up Solar Beam. The AI just sees that Solar Beam does more damage than Giga Drain, so it always goes for this on the first turn if it thinks it can get the KO. The only way that it's going to use Sunny Day is if it sees it can't get a KO with Solar Beam. So yeah, the Venusaur is going to be consistent. 
Next is Charizard. It outspeeds, uses Flamethrower, which does a lot of damage, and it causes a burn. Still, Return does enough damage, because of course it does. And I get to the Blastoise. However, now I have a really bad problem. Teddy Ursa only has 32 speed, so it is not going to move first against the Blastoise. And if Blastoise knows that Surf can get the KO, it's going to use it against me. If it thinks it can't get the KO, then it might set up Rain Dance. And if Blizzard and Surf are both KO ranges, then it might randomize between them and miss with Blizzard. Alternatively, I could try to use Protect and then see if I heal more with the leftovers than Burn does to me, but by the way, that's not how the math works. As a result, on the next turn, I have less health left over. I try to go for Return, hoping that Blastoise will randomize and use Blizzard and then just miss. Unfortunately, it uses Surf and finishes Teddy Ursa off. All right, so I've spent long enough on this fight at level 75. It is time to go back into Mount Silver and train up, maybe to level 68, and then with the 10 rare candies, I'll be level 78. I come back at this level, and uh, things are not good. <laughs> like, red is so challenging for Teddy Ursa, and I think that this is so interesting because with Fampy, Red was not a challenge at all. The fact that the ground type is immune to Red's lead Pokemon Pikachu gave Fampy free setup, and then from there, things were much easier. So I guess Fampy's typing is actually an advantage for it, and as a result, Teddy Ursa's first playthrough is not gonna clock in with a better time. So right now, I want to explain the challenges that I'm facing. Number one, while I try to set up on the Pikachu, so that I'll be able to one-hit the Espeon, Thunder can get a critical hit, or it can paralyze me, so that's one way to fail. Then against the Espeon, could get a critical hit with Psychic, or if I move onto it on the wrong turn, then it's gonna KO me with Psychic. Against Snorlax, I have to set up and use a lot of rest to be able to sustain through the fight. As a result, if it even gets one critical hit with Body Slam, Teddy Ursa loses. Venusaur is probably the most consistent Pokemon to this point in the fight. Sometimes if I do get to it with enough health though, it sets up Sunny Day, which makes the Charizard more challenging. Then against it, it could crit with Flamethrower and knock me out, or it could cause a burn like has already happened in the fight. And then after I get through this entire gauntlet and arrive at the Blastoise, I don't have enough health and it's just gonna knock me out. As a result, I went back into Mount Silver and trained up to level 80. At this point, I had saved over my rare candies because I was getting so frustrated having to use them after every single reset. Like that's just bloating Teddy Ursa's time even more. However, I think there actually might be another way to play this fight now that I'm level 80. What if on the first turn I use Protect to block Charm? Then on the second turn, I just go for Return and knock the Pikachu out as fast as possible. This gives it less chances to get Paralysis or to get a critical hit. The following Espeon sees that my health is high enough, so it sets up Reflect first turn, and then I'm actually able to just barely survive its Psychic and knock it out on the next turn. Against Snorlax, I can go for Protect on the first turn. By the way, this is so I can stall out its Body Slam PP eventually. After that, I use Rest to heal, and then I'm going to get hit by Body Slam and... Oh, so yeah, this strategy isn't going to work because it's just going to knock me out now. I tried a variant of this strategy, which is setting up Curse just once on the Pikachu so that I'll take less damage from the Snorlax's Body Slams. However, it gets a critical hit and then finishes Teddy Ursa off anyways. But in the next fight, it isn't able to get a critical hit, and I can start stacking up Curses as a result. This makes the outcome where I lose less and less likely. Yes, it can still knock me out with a critical hit, and the longer the fight takes, the more of those it's going to get. But eventually, I max out my defense stat, max out my attack stat, and knock the Snorlax out. Okay, time for the Venusaur. Unfortunately for me, because I have max health, it goes for Sunny Day, and I knock it out with my return. Next is Charizard. I am going to have to tank a Sun-Boosted Flamethrower. I do knock it out with return, and move on to Blastoise, but once again, Teddy Ursa only has orange health, and I don't even have the leftovers. So obviously using Protect won't help at all here. If I go for Rest, it's just going to outspeed and hit me. So there are only two ways I win. One, it rolls Blizzard and misses. Or two, my Quick Claw activates and I move first with Return. So let's try it. And in this case, I don't get the Quick Claw, but Blastoise uses Blizzard, misses, and Return hits, knocking the turtle out. So with a lot of luck, Teddy Ursa clocks in with a time of 2 hours, 38 minutes, and 31 seconds, with 30 resets at level 80. This took 7 hours and 37 minutes of game time. Alright, so with those first preliminary results, now let's get into an optimized playthrough and see just how fast Teddy Ursa can go. In the early game, I changed very little. After all, Teddy Ursa is so dominant in this section of the game. Just fighting all the trainers in its way and going into Faulkner at level 13 gives it an easy victory. After that, Bugsy is no challenge because I have access to Swift. 
And then the rival in Azalea Town is also not a problem because even when the Bayleaf doesn't miss and hits Razor Leaf and gets a crit, it does this much damage. So yeah, no problems for Teddy Ursa here. A small improvement I made over the first attempt was I taught Teddy Ursa Dig before I fought Whitney. This is just nice to have on your moveset in case you want to break Rollout's combo. The thing is, Teddy Ursa doesn't need to do that ever because it's going to two-hit the mill tank with Headbutt. And with that badge out of the way, I can now correct one of the mistakes that I made in the previous playthrough, and that was having to backtrack to Goldenrod City to pick up the TMs in the department store. Here, I pick up the TM for return first, and then after that I buy one copy of Thunder Punch, one copy of Fire Punch, and two copies of Ice Punch. This is going to be important later on. Next, when I'm facing the Kimono Girls, Teddy Ursa levels up to level 29, and here it has the chance to learn Rest. And this is one of the major differences between the two playthroughs. Teaching this move right now doesn't make any sense. It's just bloat. I really don't need it until the very end of the game. So by saying no to this move, I have a little bit more moveset flexibility, meaning that Teddy Ursa can learn Ice Punch in the place of Swift and Thunder Punch in the place of Faint Attack. So here is some footage of me facing the rival in Burned Tower, and obviously this is much easier if I just teach Teddy Ursa Dig. Plus, I've done some extra training in the playthrough just so that my speed is high enough that I move first against the Haunter and can take it out in one hit. With no curse on the field, this whole battle is going to be very easy. And now I want to quickly mention Hidden Power, because in second playthroughs I am allowed to set it to whatever type that I want, but in this case, I actually am not going to use it on Teddy Ursa. So today, I have Hidden Power Dark, and the only reason that's relevant is so that Teddy Ursa can have perfect stats. I go into Morty at level 33, of course with the Mint Berry, and this fight is going to be consistent. I outspeed three of his team members, with the exception of Gengar of course, and the Mint Berry is there to cover that weakness. After all, when I do hit it with Dig, it's going to be a guaranteed one hit. Now sometimes with normal type Pokemon, it makes sense to go to Mahogany Town and train on the Rocket plotline and then face Price before backtracking to face Chuck. But for Teddy Ursa, that doesn't really make sense. Now my late game plan is to fight Red at level 83 instead of level 80 like last time, so I'm going to need to squeeze out a few more levels. To do that, after defeating all the trainers in the Lighthouse, I can also polish off all the trainers at sea. This gives Teddy Ursa level 30 when it enters Chuck's gym, which is actually over two damage rounding thresholds for the Hitmonlee and for the Hitmonchan trainers. By the way, now I outspeed the Hitmonlee, so this is not a problem at all. Next, of course, is Chuck. For this fight, I'm level 39. Being over the damage rounding threshold, the level 38 gives me the one hit on the Primeape, and because it can't damage me, I am way less scared of the Polyrath, because I'm also going to two hit it with Headbutt. In this case, I cause a flinch, and yeah, that's that. Next is the Rocket Hideout, and I have a very nice time in here. Next, of course, is Price, and for this battle I changed up my moveset. I taught Return in the place of Headbutt and Fire Punch in the place of Ice Punch. That's why I got two of those TMs earlier on. With Return, I am able to one-hit all of his Pokémon, so that fight is very trivial. And next is Jasmine. Of course, dig against the Magnemites, and then use Fire Punch on the Steelix. In this case, I'm almost getting the one hit, but I don't need it. After all, Teddy Ursa can survive even a critical hit from Iron Tail. After rescuing the Director from Team Rocket, I make sure to pick up the TM for Sleep Talk. This is going to be incredibly useful later on in... I think one of the most creative and interesting ways yet. In the department store, it is time to buy vitamins, and here it is important for me to note that I am purchasing three Carbos. You might be thinking that that's kind of weird because I'm probably gonna use Curse later on. Just uh, hold your uh, horses, or like rapid ashes, I guess. The uh, final fight is gonna be more interesting, I think, than you expect. In Ice Path, I have to make sure to pick up the TM for rest. After all, I didn't learn this move through level up. And then against Claire, uh, once again, return is just the best option. Spam it against all the Dragonairs, it gets one hits, and then it almost one hits the Kingdra. I probably would have if I was level 53, but I don't need to because it can't knock me out with Surf, so that's a win. Now before the league, I fight some trainers. These are all the like people randomly scattered around before Victory Road. Then after taking an easy victory over the rival in Victory Road, Teddy Ursa is level 57. So let's face Will now, and as you can see, I have 104 speed, meaning I'm going to move first against all of his Pokemon, and that gives one hits against all of them, except the Slowbro, but it just like sets up Curse and then I knock it out, so that was easy. Next is Koga, and I could have brought Fire Punch into this fight, like I could have bought another copy of it and another copy of Thunder Punch, but I would really rather have more vitamins than doing that. After all, knocking the Fortress out in three hits isn't really an issue, it can't do very much damage. It also really only likes to select explosion if it has low health, 
And in this case, I'm moving first, so I can just knock it out. All right, so it's time for Bruno, and all the extra training I did gives me level 58 for this fight over a damage rounding threshold. Also, I have the speed required to move first against all of his Pokemon, so the first damage I take is from Mock Punch on the Hitmonchan. Next is Machamp, and unfortunately, even with the Pink Bow at level 59, I don't have a guaranteed one hit on it. I rolled the less favorable damage the first turn, but Machamp just misses Cross Chop, and I knock it out on the next turn. Onyx is obviously easy to clean up, and with that, I've made it to Karen. Because I'm at a higher level, I can do a few things to improve this fight. Number one is I can use Ice Punch first turn on the Umbreon for the occasional freeze. I don't get it here, and I just knock it out on the next turn with Return. After that, I have a guaranteed one hit on the Vileplume, and that means this fight's way easier, because then I knock the Gengar out with Earthquake. Unfortunately, because Gengar set up Curse, I take some damage against the Murkrow when I miss. I get to the Houndoom, and unfortunately here, everything falls apart. Earthquake misses, I take Curse damage, Houndoom hits Flame thrower and Teddy Ursa goes down. So that is my first reset in the second playthrough. Going in I was sort of expecting that I would have one reset on Bruno or one reset on Karen. Overall though I like my odds enough and I do make it through Karen on my next attempt. Plus once I get to Lance his team is incredibly easy for Teddy Ursa. I now with the higher level outspeed the Charizard so really the only thing that can deal damage to me is the Aerodactyl and even if it does it doesn't matter. So now let's talk about Blue. For this fight, I am going to use the Curse strategy because setting up on the Pidgeot just makes this fight completely trivial. Also additionally, I'm level 70 at this point, which means the Alakazam knows it can't get a one hit, so it just sets up Reflect on the first turn, making the fact that it outspeeds me sort of irrelevant. After that, while I sweep through the remaining Pokemon on his team, Teddy Ursa levels up to level 71, so now I'm only going to need to train like one and a half levels in Mount Silver in order to be able to face Red at level 83. All right, so as I finish up that training, I just want to quickly talk to you about just how painful this Red fight was. I continued streaming after my playthrough and we wrote down all of the moves that could potentially give me a win, like maybe Swagger, maybe Mud Slap. What about moves like Roar or Hidden Power? rest and sleep talk. I also tried strategies with a mint berry to allow me to wake up from rest faster, and none of this was working. I got a little bit frustrated, stopped streaming, and continued the work on my own. And finally, after like two hours, I found something that works. And I sort of love it. It is definitely Generation 2 flavor, but it is probably the weirdest Generation 2 flavor that I've ever had. So here's the moveset. Return, Rest, Sleep Talk, and Protect. Protect is here for two reasons. The first one is obviously so that I can avoid Charm against the Pikachu. After that, I switch into Return, and I'm able to knock it out in a single hit. Next is Espeon. Now, it's going to get one hit in no matter what it does. If it sets up Reflect, I can go for Protect again, stalling out the Reflect counter, and then knock it out on the next turn. So I have about half health left over for the Snorlax, and here's where things start getting a little bit weird. I'm going to be able to knock out the Snorlax in three hits if it has Reflect, and only two if it doesn't. First turn I'm going to get a free hit because it's going to set up Amnesia, and then after that I can use Protect to stall it out and recover a little bit more health. Next I go for another return, and now because my health is high enough it actually uses another Amnesia. This is slightly lucky, it could have gone for Body Slam, but because it didn't, I'm able to finish it off on the next turn. Next is Venusaur, and because I outspeed it, there is a weird interaction that I can cause with Sleep Talk that dramatically makes this fight more consistent. I need high health to go into the Charizard. However, I don't want to use Rest because then it will get in a Solar Beam even if it's trying to charge. However, what I can do, which I'm not going to do in this fight because I can just knock it out with return twice, is I could use Sleep Talk on the turn that it charges to waste a turn, then use Protect to cancel the Solar Beam. And then if I repeat this, Leftovers will eventually heal Teddy Ursa completely, and then I can knock the Venusaur out. Today things didn't go quite as well because it set up Sunny Day, and this is one of the flaws to this strategy. Anyways, today I just knocked the Venusaur out, and then I move on to the Charizard. Here I want to stall it out as much as possible so that the sun fades. I managed to do that, I just barely survive its second flamethrower and heal with rest. Now in Generation 2, the way Sleep Talk works is it chooses one of your other moves on your moveset and uses it, even if that move is Rest, so it can select either Return, Rest, or Protect. In the case it selects Rest, I just heal and it doesn't matter if the Charizard dealt damage to me. In the case I choose Protect, then I block its attack, and in the case I choose Return, then I deal the damage that I need to deal. I knock it out and I move on to the Blastoise. I'm still asleep, but I can use Sleep Talk and it's the exact same scenario here, so I use Return, knock the turtle out, and with that, Teddy Ursa has done it. 
It clocks in with a time of 1 hour 46 minutes and 15 seconds, with one reset at level 83. This took 6 hours and 53 minutes of game time. So overall, these results are a huge improvement from my first playthrough. At the end of the playthrough, I definitely was balancing out, like, is it going to take longer to just train up to a higher level? I checked Teddy Ursa's damage ranges at level 85, 88, and 90, and they all are not that much more favorable than they are at level 83, so I felt getting through at this level was the best balance between speed and luck. So where do these results earn it a place in the tier list? Well, it is slightly slower than Murkrow and slightly faster than Skarmory. So today it earns itself the third spot in the C tier. Like, subscribe, bring the Chimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. Thank you so much for supporting me through Patreon or YouTube memberships. It means the world to me. And now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.